Well, good afternoon. We are here live in the ThinkTech studio, uh, deep in the belly of the beast here, downtown Honolulu. And today's uh, program, Pacific Forum's Issues and Insights, we're going to be talking about the Korean War, its armistice as, as an unfinished framework for the future. And uh, joining us for this conversation is uh, a, a very special guest from the Korean consulate here in Honolulu, uh, Consul Hyun Oh Kim. And uh, Consul Kim, it's really nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Consul Kim, ladies and gentlemen, is the Consul for Political Affairs. Uh, and uh, he is joined in the studio uh, by Mr. Kerry Gershanik, the Senior Associate and Director for Governmental Affairs, Marketing, and all kinds of other important stuff at Pacific Forum CSIS. Nice to have you here, Kerry. Thank you, David. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Kerry is also a um, former Marine officer uh, that has served in South Korea and in fact if I understand the the uh, the trails that the two of you uh, actually walked in your service to your respective countries you actually were on the same mountain but in different time zones in different times is that correct yes the uh, the the consul consul Kim and I both uh, he was in the Republic of Korea I mean and I was in the U.S. Marine Corps working alongside the ROC Army and the ROC Marines, and we both patrolled the same portion of northeastern uh, Korea, very tough mountainous terrain where, at the time I was doing it, um, still were communist North Korean guerrillas operating there, and uh, the, the, the consul was a little bit younger than me, so uh, fortunately <laughs> by the time that uh, he was there with the, uh, the ROC Army, it was uh, still tough terrain, still very cold, minus 30 Celsius, and uh, you spit and it freezes before it hits the ground. It's very cold, tough terrain. You wear out boots in about three weeks there. Uh, so yes, we have trod on common ground and it was tough ground. <laughs> All right, we also have in the studio with us a, um, uh, a colleague in some sense uh, having to do with educational institutions, which we'll, we'll get into in a moment, uh, Mr. Uh, Sung Ho uh, Kim. Sung Ho Hong. Hong, Hong. There are a lot of Kims in Korea. Yeah, I know. There's so many Kims, but we got Sung Ho Hong, who is a um, Kelly Fellow, right, yes. with the, the Pacific Forum? Yes. And um, uh, Sung Ho, you, you and uh, Consul Kim both are graduates of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Yes, that's correct. Right. Awesome. That's, that's great. That's great. Well, let's, let's, let's start out this uh, kind of the, the, the beginning so that our audience can begin to picture this, this framework. Um, and let me start with you, Consul Kim. We got uh, a, a, an important date, uh, June 25, mm -hmm. 1950, and a series of commemorations taking place uh, here in Hawaii and I gather elsewhere uh, in, in, in the region having to do with what? In fact, it's taking place from Thailand to UK to France to Turkey, all of the world. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure major cities in the United, United States, they are observing this date. We are commemorating the Korean War veterans, uh, the people who fought for the Korean War, as well as the people who made a contribution for the, for the greatest alliance between the Korea and the United States. Let's put this in a little bit of perspective for our audience. Um, uh, uh, and let's start with the kind of the big number, if you will. What do we have in terms of involvement of, uh, of uh, South Korean military soldiers uh, in, the, in the Korean War. How, how, many, how many participated in that? What, what kind of numbers are involved there? Well, someone is probably more knowledgeable about the history of the issue, but back then uh, we had about 3 million Korean, uh, Koreans died as approximately, we had about 20 million populations back then. So we can see it was a very big war for very small countries. Okay, now let me jump to, so we get some perspective for our audience here. What's the, the size of the, the uh, American military participation, or UN, however you want to do it, in, in, term, in terms of the Korean War? Well, there were actually 16 countries that deployed the combat units. Uh, when I say combat units, those are who are fighting on the battlefield. But if you include um, other uh, countries that send the medical support units or combat service support units, it turns out that uh, those numbers uh, become 63 countries. So there was a recent study done by the Minister of National Defense. 63 uh, countries yes, involved that's on the South Korean side. 
uh, the South Korean side, whether they were just uh, supporting the materials or intended to support the materials, all those numbers together is 63 out of about 90 some countries back then in 1950s. D David, understand that this is the United Nations. Yes. The United Nations responds when we have the communist aggression from North Korea. So it's, but it's not just North Korea. It's North Korea backed by uh, the Soviet Union. The, the Operation right. Order is written in Cyrillic for the attack. And then it's, uh, it's Russians flying aircraft, uh, shooting down American and, and UN aircraft, um, flying against us. It's, it's 600,000 People's Republic of China ground and air forces coming in the, the war against the United Nations forces. So that's, that's really how you have to frame it. It wasn't just North Korea, South Korea. Initially, uh, Sang-ho will we'll talk about the attack. Initially, the attack is North Korea uh, savagely uh, invading South Korea. But then it becomes a, a world war fought on a peninsula. It's the world, the United Nation against the communist bloc. In 1950? In 1950. Okay. The first major war, the first major shooting war of the Cold, Cold war. war. All right. Before we get to Sung Ho, Kerry, um, what, you've had an enormous connection with the U.S. military during your career, and you know the history really well. Can you give our audience the, uh, the general size of the American military participation in, in the Korean, Korean War? What are we talking about in numbers of, of troops, as an example? Well, the, the number could be misleading, so I have to put it in context. The number ultimately, either in the peninsula or around, gets up to 5,700,000. Okay, okay. So that's, that's how many are devoted across the board to, to helping to fight the war in Korea and save the Republic of Korea. Uh, from that, we lose, through all deaths, about almost uh, a little more than 54,000, 54,300 almost uh, dead. Those who did never heard, probably, of Korea, never had met a Korean in their lives, and that they stepped up and said, I will go fight, and in their case, die on behalf of this, this small country that, that's being invaded by the Communist North. Okay. We still have 7,900 missing, incidentally. Seven, almost 8,000 missing. Almost 8,000, so the joint uh, POW-MIA accountability uh, folks over at uh, Hickam Base, uh, they're, they're working very hard to account for them, but bottom line is we probably aren't going to account for the vast majority. Okay, and so back over to you, Consul Kim. You, you are uh, uh, undertaking this program in your personal capacity mm -hmm and speaking uh, uh, not as an official representative of the, the government of South Korea. Uh, uh, but because you are here in Hawaii, can you, can you take and drill down from the, the numbers that Kerry just gave to the Hawaii participation in the Korean War? What does that look like? Actually, this week uh, kept me quite busy because uh, it it's been a meaningful week for, for the Koreans as well as the Korean War veterans here in Hawaii commemorating the 63rd anniversary of the start of the Korean War. As well as, as well as the 60th anniversary of the Korea-U.S. alliance. Um, in commemorating those, a series of events took place. And in Hawaii alone, I can just uh, give you a number from actually the governor, Abe Crombie, mentioned okay. it during his Memorial Day speech. What, what are those numbers? Hawaii like? deployed about 456 soldiers. That's the largest number per capita among all 50 states in America. Not, not out of them, as uh, Kerry mentioned, 41 POWs, and 20 are still missing in action from Hawaii. 20 still missing mm -hmm. from Hawaii. Wow. So, Sung Ho, let's go over to you now, and um, uh, let's let's take this this commemoration date that we've been talking about. This June 25, 1950. Mm -hmm. um, what happens there? So, uh, June 25th uh, in South Korea, in, in, it's happened right right after the uh, midnight, early in the uh, morning. So, the North Korea invaded South Korea with uh, troops of night. Um, 190,000 at the initial, while uh, South Korea has 90,000. So 190,000 versus 90,000 without yes, warning. It's, yes. Is there any warning it's, at all? Nope. It's, it's a total number, surprise. Total surprise. And uh, in the week of um, the, the beginning of the war, uh, the Seoul was conquered in three days, the capital of South Korea. And yeah. So Seoul falls immediately. Yeah, in, in three days. Wow. And and in one month, ninety of South, I mean, whole Korean Peninsula was dominated by uh, North Korean troops. So the North Koreans drove all the way down to a little perimeter around Busan. Uh, Busan area, that's correct. Okay. And the uh, there's some group of people in still Korea still think that the uh, uh, still confused who's 
invading whom first. So there's a little debate over, but it's it's an obvious fact that we we didn't. I mean, South Korea didn't have any tank back then, while North Korea had like 240, 242 uh, Soviet Union very developed um, tanks over there. So it really doesn't make sense that that South Korea started war. Yeah. So we got, a, we, got, we, got, we got a smash that goes all the way to Busan. Mm -hmm. And then, Carrie, I want to go over to you now. And, and uh, how about, because our time is short here, right. I want you to give our audience some, some highlights of, of uh, kind of the, the, the key aspects of the war real quick here. What, what happens next? We're, we're down on this per peninsula. Uh, we've got uh, the South Koreans create a, a, a perimeter. We've got some American forces there. South Koreans f fight very bravely. They uh, uh, do not have the equipment they need. America does not let them have it because Sigmund Rhee, the president of South Korea, we didn't want to give him the means to attack North Korea. So as Song Ho said, uh, the, the revisionist historians, leftist professors all have until recently stuck to the story that the South started it. The reality is even, the, even Russia, after the, the fall of communism, admitted they started it. And China admitted as late as 2010 that yes, it was North Korea that, that started it. So what happens is the, the Koreans aren't, don't have the equipment, they fall back fighting bravely. America has debilitated, totally decimated basically the U.S. armed forces. The great power that won the war against Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan by dereliction of duty, quite frankly, of the President of the United States and the Congress of the United States. They allow that great force to completely deteriorate. It becomes a completely hollow force. The young soldiers from Japan that are sent in to help the uh, South Koreans get slaughtered. We will continue this interesting story and how it relates to the current day after the break. 760 KGU. Part of the Wall Street Business Network. In Kahala, they're still working on that water main break. There's only one lane open on Kahala Avenue by Wailai Beach Park, so HPD is contraflowing traffic through the one open lane and expects it to be like that for several hours. No new accidents or stalls. The drive east to Hawaii Kai is normal, no problems to the windward side. Going west, the H1 slows at the Hickam Curve. The Moanalua slows at Moanalua Gardens. Civic Forum CSIS is a nonprofit, nonpartisan foreign policy organization affiliated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. From right here in Honolulu, Pacific Forum has, since 1975, provided analysis on current and emerging political, economic, business, and security issues for leaders throughout the U.S. and Asia. Also, the Pacific Forum Young Leaders Program brings young professionals and next generation leaders from around the U.S., Asia, and Europe together to observe and participate in high-level, multinational dialogues normally reserved for senior policy experts. To provide your support for the Young Leaders Program and to send future generation leaders abroad to ensure peace and prosperity in the Pacific, please contact Pacific Forum at 808 521 6745. That's 808 521 6745. Or you can visit them on the web at pacforum.org. That's P A C forum.org. 
Your product is selling well locally, so why export? Because 95% of all consumers live in foreign markets. Why not expand your market and increase your sales with help from the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone, your hub of international trade in Hawaii? The Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone offers you the services and support you need to start, grow, and succeed in your import-export business. Find them on Facebook at forward slash dash Hawaii FTZ or on the web at www.ftz9.org. We're live and we're talking about the Korean War and its armistice as an unfinished framework for the future of uh, the North Korean Peninsula. And uh, right at the break, uh, one of our, our several guests in the studio, Mr. Kerry Gershanik, uh, who is a former Marine officer that served in South Korea and is now the, um, a senior associate and director of governmental relations with Pacific Forum, was talking about kind of the history of the war. We also have in the studio, in case you just joined the show, uh, Consul Hyun Oh Kim, the Consul for Political Affairs at the South Korean Consulate here in Hawaii. And, uh, and we also have with us a, uh, a fabulous Korean scholar, a Kelly Fellow at the Pacific Forum, and that's uh, Mr. Sung Ho um, Hong. And uh, so let's go back, Kerry, to where we were. Uh, we we're talking about kind of the, the, the aftermath of this uh, massive invasion by North Korea on June 25, uh, 1950, in which the North Koreans smashed through uh, Seoul drove the South Korean and American forces down to this little tiny perimeter in the very southern tip of the island at Busan. What happens next? U.S. forces again have been gutted quite badly by the president uh, failure and the co failure of Congress to properly fund them and ensure the proper discipline. So they go in uh, piecemeal. They do not have winter clothing, they don't have sleeping bags, they have insufficient ammunition, inadequate weapons. The bazookas that they have at the time can't even stop the uh, North Korean tanks. They're, that's how bad the material is that they're asked to go to war with. Um, so the, the perimeter of all of South Korea becomes a small area around the city of Busan. They hold. Sending the Marines from Camp Pendleton, the Marines help hold the Busan perimeter. Meantime, General MacArthur uh, develops a force of uh, the 1st Marine Division that comes in and lands at Incheon, cuts off the North Korean supply lines, pushes up to the north, China enters the war. Okay, China this? sends in 600,000 ultimately, uh, 120, 130,000 or so by the end of October have crossed in. Washington knows about it, incidentally. Washington, the intel agencies know about it. The politicians choose to ignore the fact that China could attack, and that, that again is eerily familiar, I think, with some thought processes today, as is the gutting of our military, but we'll, that's for a separate topic. So again, uh, the UN forces now, because it's not just the United Nations, it's all those countries that the, uh, the consul, the consul Kim was talking about, get pushed back again. And the war becomes a seesaw and a stalemate after the first months of the war, it then becomes bloody skirmishes and incredibly tough terrain and brutal weather uh, just to hold the line at the 38th parallel until the so-called peace negotiations are settled more than two years later. So that's a July 27th, 1953. Yes. Armistice is signed at a place called Patmunjong. Right. That is, and that area is now known, the line of demarcation is now known as the demilitarized zone which, uh, am I wrong, Kerry, is, is, is that today the heaviest fortified perimeter or border in the world? It is. It is. You, uh, you take your life into your hands when you go there. You take your life in your hands even if you go in with, as I did, uh, assisting my capacity as, a, as, a, as an officer uh, with platoon-sized units, you're still taking your life in your hand because there are infiltrators who are trying to kill you. There's landmines that, that shift. It's not that they were put in the wrong position. It's just over time they shift booby traps, other, other wow. things. So it's, wow. it's, it's a very 
It's a very well fortified area and an extremely dangerous area. But uh, perhaps Ongo, you could talk about. I talked about the military side of the right. war. Just in addition to that, Seoul is only about forty miles away from the demarcation line. Forty so miles mm -hmm. within so artillery range, and North Korea Seoul. has about yeah. eighty thousand gun That's tubes, yeah. oh, artillery oh, tubes oh. aimed at Seoul. Still so, a dangerous. So, no, what, what's what's the what's the condition of South Korea at that? At that time, in terms of its the, the civilian population mm -hmm. and physically, what do you see? What, so, as a, as a result of this war, I mean, it's just completely not just South Korea, including North Korea. It just burned down to total ashes, and um, we lost uh, not we lost a million people, civilians. A million civilians. A million civilian, including um, um, one hundred eight. 80,000 uh, soldiers, including US, uh, UN nations, and, and uh, it was just total mess. It's just so you're, burned you're down to the ashes. Burned to the ashes. So yeah. the country is reduced to to rubble, yeah. basically. I would say one of the poorest nation in the world at that time. When you say ashes, it's not a euphemistic term. It's actually literally meant to ashes. So if I can just to give you an image. Uh, there was a quoting from this American officer who served in the Korean War. He said, "There's not even a military target left in, in the Korean Peninsula, you know, to, to strike." And General MacArthur once said, uh, "You take about more than 100 years to restore this country. So more basically, than, that more than 100 years to just to restore the level." That's an interesting comment mm -hmm. coming from Douglas MacArthur that's because true. because he, in making that statement, he was he was coming from his prior position as the, what is the Governor General of Japan, and he was in the process of had some experience in rebuilding Japan. So he's predicting mm -hmm. 100 years, more than 100 years, more than 100 years for uh, the South Korean portion of the peninsula to recover. Yeah, so just to give you the wow. number, uh, wow. the GNP per capita in 1953 for South Korea was a $61. Uh, so, um, if you think about just to, to make a comparison, think about the most one of the most poorest countries on earth, on earth these days. They have about two to three hundred uh, dollars, and Korea nowadays they have more than twenty two thousand uh, twenty two thousand U S dollars you know, GNI per capita. So, you can see uh, how fast this is going over the past six decades. Let me go over this one more time because sure. because I, mm -hmm. I think this is important for our audience. It's very interesting. At the time the armistice was was signed or shortly thereafter, what you have is a $61 per capita GDP in South Korea. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and today, the per capita GDP of North Korea is? Uh, since North Korea is an extremely opaque country, we don't really have the statistics, but we say about less than 2,000, which is about less than one-tenth of the uh, South Korea. Okay, and did I hear you say that at the time, or shortly after the war, you get you get a something like a $200 per capita in the north and a $61 per capita in the south? Is that, is that about, about? About, about the twice more than, uh, even through the 70s, the North Korea was more affluent up to some certain point. Interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. And, and of course, the number that you gave, the 22,000. More than, yeah, 22,000. It is, it is just, uh, uh, and that's why they, uh, Korea has this, uh, this uh, phrase, they say, Korea sparkling. Korea sparkling, the, the Han River miracle. But it's not only the number that I want to emphasize, but Korea became, uh, over the past six decades, Korea was the major recipient of the foreign aid, but now it's the, one of the donors of the foreign aid for the developed countries. So going from recipient, going from to, the donor. recipient to the donors, and, wow. and the, of course the, the Korean culture these days, Gangnam Style and Sai, <laughs> Korean Wave is swapping the corners of the world. Actually, I arrived here in March. Uh, every time I meet some of the officials in Hawaii, they mention about, are you following this Korean drama that I'm watching? So <laughs> I have to know the, you know the drama stories and all those. So it's, uh, it's meaningful for us to respond to that and it's meaningful to see how the Korea has developed well, you know, the past six, six decades. I mean, I mean, we'll get into this, but I mean, the, the picture, we started out with this this numbers, Sung Ho, at, at $61. Yeah. And so if we look at um, the poorest countries in the world today, I'm not so sure you can find one with a 
uh, per capita GDP at as low as sixty one dollars. No, 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 no way. It's impossible. So, so, uh, and this this rise from the ashes to Korea sparkling to uh, Gangnam style mm -hmm. as as a, as a global. In many ways, global influence and global power is is just an absolute uh, miracle, uh, remarkable piece. But it was set up, was it not, by this framework of the Korean War, right? That's why we want to go back to the story about um, commemorating uh, Korean War here in Hawaii. We Koreans believe that it's not uh, due to our diligence that we were able to achieve this far. We, uh, it's because of the alliance that took place, uh, the mutual defense treaty that was signed in 1953. Because of the protection and commitment to the defense of its ally uh, by the United States, we were able to uh, achieve this uh, rapid economic growth. That's why we want to thank uh, all those who fought in the Korean War, and we think it's a meaning for, for us to show our respect to them. Mm -hmm. So you have, you've given a uh Consul Kim, you've given a very interesting perspective uh, using the Korean War as kind of a lens to look at the future, and we'll talk more about this when we come back after the break. Stay with us, ladies and gentlemen. We've got more, and it's going to get exciting. Seven sixty KGU, part of the Wall Street Business Network. We've got one accident uh, right now. It's up in Kaimuki on Wailai Avenue at Center Street. Traffic still being contraflowed on Kahala Avenue by Wailai Beach Park because of this morning's water main break. If you're going west, the H1 is now backing up onto the airport viaduct. The Moana Lua slows at Moana Lua Gardens. Inbound traffic from the west is slow from Ola Lane to the Pali exit. No problems to Hawaii Kai or the windward side. is also brought to you by Hawaiian Electric Company, powering the growth and development of Hawaii since it was chartered by King Kalakaua in 1891. Today, Hawaiian Electric and its subsidiaries, Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company, serve more than 95% of our state, providing reliable electric service essential to our quality of life. The Hawaiian Electric Companies are also leading our transition to clean energy by increasing our renewable energy use, and improving energy efficiency, we're reducing Hawaii's dependence on imported oil and in providing a more sustainable and secure future for Hawaii. For more information, visit hawaiisenergyfuture.com. ThinkTech Hawaii is a Hawaii nonprofit corporation organized in the year 2000. Its purpose is to raise public awareness about the importance of technology, energy, agriculture, and globalism to the diversification and expansion of our economy. We do this by television shows on community television and on OC16, by newspaper articles, and by our Think Tech radio series on KGU 760 AM. We also do it by panel programs and events, including our monthly luncheon programs with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. Think Tech, working to raise public awareness in Hawaii. Check us out at thinktechhawaii.com. We are back, and we're talking about the Korean War as a framework for uh, the future, uh, kind of an unfinished future. And we have in the uh, studio with us uh, Consul Hyun Oh 
Kim uh, with the Korean Consulate here in Honolulu, uh, Mr. Kerry Gershanik, who is with Pacific Forum CSIS, and uh, Sung Ho Hong, who is also the resident Korean scholar Kelly Fellow at Pacific Forum CSIS. And right at the break, we were talking about, uh, I was talking with Consul Kim about kind of the the perspective, and he was sharing with us the um, enormous gratitude that the Korean people and the government of Korea uh, uh, have for the opportunity that was created by the United States for Korea's development. Yeah. And uh, Consul Kim, in looking at this, this, this framework created by the Korean War for the future, uh, are, are there some other just bullet items that you want to hit in, in terms of things that, that were developed or policies or relationships that were created as a consequence of this war in addition to the, the, the U.S.-South uh, Korea alliance? Well, alliance has a lot of meaning to a lot of people depending on your, the generation you belong to. Uh, the reason that I emphasize the Korean War veterans is that when they were participating in the war, they were only 17, 18, 19. They, they didn't even heard about the place called the Korea, but still they sacrificed their life and their dreams and aspirations and they're putting aside all those still participated in, in, in that and fought together with the Koreans. So I uh, sincerely uh, want to show my respect for, for their sacrifice and contribution for uh, what we do, what we enjoy, uh, besides the democracy and freedom. And what we enjoy today is uh, heavily attrib attributable to those sacrifices. Now, Sung Ho, what from your perspective, what is the, the, the framework for the future that this Korean War, Korean War created? What, what, are, what do you see from this? Um, yes, I mean, yeah, it's a good point that uh, Consul Kim made that it's not the GNI or economic things that we are enjoying and we have to appreciate. It's the liberty and uh, vibrant democracy that we have in the region. It's one of the, the uh, two, like, vibrant democracy that we have in Asia. Actually. And there is a robust democracy in South Korea now. Right, in, right. In fact, in fact your legislature, uh, <laughs> they sometimes have, they sometimes get into it, don't yes. they? <laughs> okay, go yes. ahead. Yeah, so the, the, it still has the problem to solve in the future started in Korean War back in 1950s. And this is the barrier that North Korea brings as an economic um, obstacle in the region. So we have to solve this problem in, in the future to, to uh, see the more prosperity of economic Asia. Like, so, so most of the people in our office, Pacific Forum CSIS, plus all the think tanks and um, diplomats, and we have to continue uh, focusing on uh, pro solving problems on um, Korean Peninsula. You know, Sung Ho, what, what, you're, what you're seeing, if I, if I understand you correctly, is that, that the, the, a piece of the aftermath of the Korean War is that it, it, with the, the uh, armistice and the, and the, the truce at Patmanjong, it effectively blocks the development or freezes the economic potential of the of the Korean Peninsula because only the half that was supported by the United States was allowed to grow and develop and prosper. Mm -hmm. And the other half is in stagnation. Yeah. And yet that other half does have a valuable resource and that's the the North Korean people. It has labor. And it does have a valuable resource mm -hmm. of, of uh, minerals and other natural resources which are undeveloped. Right, uh, and I suppose there are some other economic benefits of of the trade that could occur if if the barrier was removed. That's what you're saying. Yeah, think about this. I mean, we are we call this northeast three stars, including China, South Korea, and Japan. Their their uh, economic trade volume is one of the uh, dominant ones right. in the world. Imagine when North Korea problem is solved. I mean, this 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 strong economic. That's, that's the missing piece, is it yes, not? Yes, that's it's the thing. They're they're should understand about this denuclearization okay, and okay, okay. Now, now can reform. For our audience, I think it's important to, to recognize a very, very significant point here, and that is that that this, all this benefit, the sparkling Korea, the, the Gangnam style and everything, uh, and Korea's uh, significant 
participation on the world stage, its, it's leader of the G20 and so forth, um, might not have happened. And, and, and Carrie, why was that? Why, 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 why was there any question that, that South Korea would, would rise to becoming a, a great power in, in the world? I have to think back of what the world looked like in the late 1940s. You had a massive Soviet Union threat in Europe. You had uh, the fall of China to Mao Zedong's forces. Communism had just taken over China. Communism was on the march in Europe. Um, Dean Acheson, who was our Secretary of State at that time, makes a speech in early 1950 in which he lays out America's security interests. He fails to mention South Korea. He does not, it's by intention. It, it's just not a big interest for the Truman administration. So what happened, according to uh, defectors from North Korea, this really impacted, this had a profound influence on Kim Il-sung. He saw that as his opportunity to okay. reunify the Korean Peninsula on his terms, the communist terms. And so he went to Mao Zedong in, in China and he, and, he, and he went to Stalin in, in uh, the Soviet Union, got their blessing, got their support, and attacked. Uh, it was only after the attack on June 25th that the Truman administration made an about face and Dean Acheson realized that uh, everybody in that administration realized, big mistake, we have to respond. Our credibility around the world is at stake. That changes the whole power structure in Asia, though, for the better. Uh, America sends in the fleet, the Seventh Fleet, to protect Taiwan because now we actually care whether Taiwan falls or not, because up to that point it's questionable in the Truman administration whether they're going to defend Taiwan if Mao's forces come across the Taiwan Straits. Other areas around the region, we strengthen Japan, we strengthen a number of other alliances, build a number of other alliances. So now we've built the bulwark as a result of this egregious mistake that Dean Acheson made. We now learned a big lesson. We got sucker punched by North Korea, China, and Russia, or the Soviet Union. And now we've learned a lesson, and now we build the structure that helps us to contain the Soviet Union. You now can find the term, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, in pre-1991 atlases only. It does not exist because then we got serious after this attack about our policy of containment of the Soviet Union, and it worked. Interesting. But for, but for that about face and policy, the Truman administration, these, this rise from the ashes that Consul Kim has been talking about would not have happened. When you look at a satellite image of the North Korean Peninsula, you see a vibrant, you see just a, a bright sparkling at night South Korea. It's all lit up, lights right, everywhere. Right, right, right. North Korea is totally black. That, the whole peninsula would be totally black today had we not stepped in. Japan, very likely as a result of that, would have at least gone neutral if not gone over to the Soviet bloc or the China or the, or the, the communist bloc, the whole world would be very different, not nearly as prosperous and safe. It ain't a great place today, but it's really significantly better than it would have been had we not intervened and helped our ally, the Republic of Korea. So Ho, let's go over to you. Um, we have a situation here now where um, we got this, you brought up the concept of this, the, the need to put in this, uh, uh, solve this problem. And the problem is in dealing with North Korea. Yeah. Okay. And so fortunately, we've got Consul Kim here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn the focus of the head, the, 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 the question around that, that or the answer that, that you gave earlier, focus the light on Consul Kim for a second, and, and Consul Kim, what, what are the challenges that, uh, that the South Korea faces in dealing with, with North Korea? What are the challenges? Good what question. So whenever I uh, have a, give a lecture and, uh, to... Uh, before you answer, ladies and gentlemen, you should know that, that Consul Kim has, has been involved in the, as a, in the executive group uh, with the six-party talks, right? And also, uh, you had some connection with the investigation of the Chonan incident? I was actually the action officer for those groups, and I was action officer in charge of the Chonan sinking and the Waipido shelling took place in 2011. So, so those incidents, the Chonan, the uh, uh, Yongpyeong? Yongpyeong, the Waipido shelling. Shelling and uh, the six-party talks, you've had 
an opportunity to be face to face with the North Koreans, not only in physical actions, but in intellectual discussions back and forth, their diplomats and so forth. Okay. With that as a pretext, <laughs> the question is, what, what do you see as the, the, the challenge that South Korea has in, 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 in working with the North Koreans? What are the challenges? Maybe I can combine what Kerry has mentioned with uh, someone's comments. Whenever I give a lecture to the uh, college students in Korea, I start with a photo of a satellite photo that he mentioned about the contrast between North and South Korea. But uh, how we were able to do that, um, attributable to the armistice. Although armistice is considered as a temporary thing, it has been um, effectively uh, effective to, to maintain peace and stability on the southern part of the Korea so that we could achieve the economic miracle there. Eventually it's going to go ahead and uh, reunify Korea, but in the meantime, the back to your question is that we have to bring the northern side, North Korea, back to the right side of history. I mean, they can do whatever they want, the provocations back in, you know, for the past 20 years, they had a nuclear issue, provocation is assassinations. All those things have uh, not been able to achieve anything. Uh, they mentioned that they would like to achieve both a nuclear state as well as economic prosperity. It's not going to happen. The international state, uh, community is strongly condemning uh, their behavior as well as uh, further, uh, they are further is isolating itself. So we want to just bring North Korea back to the table. Okay, so bringing North Korea back to the table, um, I guess there's a there's a there's a, a relationship between bringing North Korea back to the table, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about what that relationship is and the strategy after the next break. And so, ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. We have a, a wonderful uh, panel here in the studio with us, and we'll be back after the break. 760 KGU. Part of the Wall Street Business Network. One new accident, Waipahu Farrington Highway at Paiva Street. Going west, the Moana Lewis Lows in Fort Chapter Flats, H1 uh, at the airport on ramp on the viaduct. Inbound traffic is slow from Ola Lane to the Punahou exit. Normal to the windward side and Hawaii Kai. In Kahala, there's still only one lane open on Kahala Avenue at Wailai Beach Park because of that water main break that we had this morning. Asia in Review is no exception. The Thursday Asia Business and Foreign Policy shows here on ThinkTech are hosted by David Day, a well-known international lawyer with extensive experience in the business and geopolitical issues of the Asia-Pacific region. Come join David as ThinkTech illuminates Hawaii's bridge to Asia with fascinating and lively discussions, featuring experts who unwind the critical issues and then probe for the solutions. Asia in Review with David Day. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by the State Energy Office of the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. How can we secure a better future for Hawaii? One way is clean energy, and the State Energy Office is steering Hawaii to that clean energy future. Hawaii is rich with natural renewable resources, the sun, the wind, the ocean, and the land. And they are all being tapped to meet Hawaii's clean energy initiatives to generate electricity, create jobs, spur economic growth, and reduce our dependence on imported foreign oil. To learn more, visit energy.hawaii.gov.
We are back and we're talking about the 63rd anniversary of the commencement of the Korean War and how that Korean War and its armistice created a framework for a future in Northeast Asia. And um, right at the break, in case you just joined us, uh, uh, Consul uh, Hyuno Kim from the Korean consulate here in Honolulu was, was talking about the, uh, the need or the perspective on the part of South Korea to get the North Koreans back to the table so that uh, hopefully uh, with the right kind of skill and time that the North Korea could be brought back into the right side of history as you put it or into the community of nations or uh, perhaps differently as our Korean scholar here Sung Ho Hong has said uh, the missing piece for economic development yeah. on the Korean Peninsula. And so let's jump now to a, you know, a partially related topic, and that is uh, the new uh, Lady President, Madam Park, uh, is, is now visiting China. And um, uh, Consul Kim, what's, what's the purpose of that trip? She's actually visiting as we speak. She just had her first day, and it's probably the second day morning in, in China. She's there uh, at the invitation by President Xi Jinping as a state visit. Um, we can understand easily by her slogan saying that her, um, of understanding the ambience of the visit, it's the journey that builds hearts and trust. So we basically want to go there to build hearts and trust with the Chinese counterpart. And actually the Chinese counterpart responded back by saying he welcomes an old friend of his, okay. the Chinese uh, uh, friend, uh, people. So there, Although the, the North Korea is not the major topic of theirs today, more comprehensive, they have actually come up with a joint declaration on the first day after the summit covering the whole range of issue between uh, Korea and China. But um, I mean, is there a connection with North Korea in their discussions? Yes, the, the, when I said uh, bringing North Korea back to the right side of the history and back to the table, I meant uh, they, need to be, they need to come back uh, with a sincerity to denuclearize, going back to the international obligations that it that he committed in 2009, 2005. Uh, in, in response to that, actually, the Madam President, President Park, mentioned this uh, trust-building process for the Korean Peninsula. That's the hallmark of the, uh, her North Korean policy. He basically uh, emphasizes that we want to safeguard peace and make peace. For safeguard peace, we want to uh, depend on uh, the strong combined deterrence capability. Okay. So whenever you try to uh, make a provocations, it's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to deter it, and it's, we're going to pay the price. But at the same time, as I said, in order to induce them to the right side of a history, we want to have the windows and doors open for them. So if you choose the right path by showing the sincerity with uh, specific actions towards denuclearization, uh, we can invite you to the international community and support you, support you with the, uh, the economic uh, benefits, as, uh, as someone just mentioned. There are tremendous benefits for them to, to share. So. So, so the strategy is mm -hmm. to either I don't know which word you prefer, to either teach or to seduce uh, North Koreans to back to the table for meaningful talks. But the trust uh, building policy is not actually the appeasement policy nor the, the collapse-inducing uh, collapse policy, but we want to emphasize that provocation, that the usual pattern that they use, right, they're right. used to, the The, the Chonin-style provocation. Provocation rewarding, as the President Obama mentioned, he's not going to buy the horse twice. The provocation, rewarding provocation, rewarding, that's okay. going to have to stop. But on the other hand, a door is open for you. So if you choose, you can come to the right side of a history uh, or the international community along with uh, Korea. Uh, probably the China and U.S. is ready to assist uh, North Korea. If okay, so so Madam Park then visits, mm -hmm. with that as, as the philosophy of her party or her administration, right. mm -hmm. she then visits uh, Xi Jinping today. She actually had a meeting with Xi Jinping today. She, she's meeting Li Keqing, the premier, and also Zhang Zijin, maybe I pronounced it wrong, okay, so the did, head of the Chinese uh, legislature. Has anything in that series of meetings in Beijing, ha, has anything occurred that would give shed some light on this strategy to, to, to do, uh, take action to begin to motivate the North Koreans back to the negotiating table? Has anything occurred? Actually, both uh, leaders of the countries have agreed and said uh, they, they oppose the talks for talks sake with North Korea. 
Um, China has, as you know, the North Korea's biggest source of diplomatic and economic support. Uh, their trade is a fraction of the mutual trade between China and the South Korea. China has comes up and now says that it's not going to just sit idly and let North Korea conduct its provocations. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again slowly. China said in this joint communique that it is, it is what? It's not going to just sit so idly? Just so if I can um, be more elaborating. Um, both presidents have agreed on the importance of faithfully carrying out the UN Security Council resolutions that called for sanctions against North Korea, which wow, is the wow. first part of the trust building process, right. safeguarding the peace. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And both sides confirmed that denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula and keeping peace and stability there in their, is the, their common interest. They agreed to make joint efforts to that end. And two leaders share their views that the Korean Peninsula tr trust building process, which I just laid out, is helpful in safeguarding and making peace on the Korean Peninsula. So that's a pretty strong message. Uh, I don't know how the North Korea is trying to interpret it, but China is ha sharing our views that their provocation will have to stop and they have to come back to the right side of the history. So, so no, you strong. have heard this uh, language of the joint communique huh? and you've heard uh, Consul Kim explain this. Um, what, how do you think the uh, how do you think Pyongyang is going to read this? Okay, this is government explanation, and my explanation, in short, is um, Madame Parks understand this Chinese leverage, this Chinese leverage in North Korea, and she is trying to send a signal that oh, your old friends is working with me now, so this possibly will have a big impact on North Korea to change their behavior since. They're one of the best allies in, in, in history is getting closer to their enemy, South Korea. So possibly, I mean. So she, in essence, is, is, is working to set up China to help South Korea yes. put the squeeze on North Korea. Right. Right? Yeah. Putting, putting it. Although it's a too early to tell uh, whether China actually has come up with an uh, uh, alternative solution to North Korea, but we've seen indication from the academics in, in China that China is actually debating as we speak whether um, North Korea will be considered in the future as their asset to their national interest. And we, uh, have, we have to wait and see how the China is going to uh, react to that. Kerry, uh, give you the last word on this. Uh, how, how do you see this little development that has, or maybe it's a huge, I think it's a huge development, but a sh short statement that's taken place uh, in Beijing. How do you read this? I think from an American standpoint, that anyone who says I can prognosticate, I can predict the future when it comes to North Korea is uh, naive at best and, and foolish at worst. I, I, I don't want to pretend like this is going to go any place really positive, but I do defer to the judgment of the, uh, the young men here from the Republic of Korea. They're closer to the issue, and so if they're optimistic about it, I will join them in their optimism for now. Well, you know, there's been a, been a, been a strategy that's been talked about, about the United States needs to find a way to get China to put pressure on North Korea. And, uh, it, and, and it's in China's best interest it, to be seen as the road to North Korea, right. always the route. But never until now, the one who's accountable for North Korea's action or at least accepts responsibility. So we'll see how this goes. Again, I will be cautiously optimistic. And uh, I'll, I'll sit here side by side with my Korean brothers and, and hope that this all turns out for the best. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that uh, this particular program has, has been helpful for you, that you've learned something. Uh, a lot of times uh, the, the Korean War is, uh, is referred to as the Forgotten War. And uh, it, if, you, if you delve into its history and the ramifications of the Korean War, you can see that it really created a framework for uh, the development on the Korean Peninsula and also the non-development on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, the United States has been uh, talking about uh, how could we somehow maneuver China to assist us. And uh, uh, one of the, I think, the, the, the remarkable pieces of information that comes from this particular show, as pointed out by Consul Kim here, is that, that uh, South Korea's new lady president, uh, in making this trip to China, uh, it, it certainly has the possibility that she has maneuvered maneuvered the Chinese into a position that's uh, a lot more productive, potentially, 
than we have seen in the past. And uh, uh, I want to thank all three of you for joining us on this program. And ladies and gentlemen, next week, if you'll uh, tune in at the same time at uh, 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon, we'll have an Asian review show and we'll be talking about some aspect of international business. So please have a safe drive home.